Please welcome Celia Hodent, game user experience strategist, author The Gamer's Brain, The Psychology of Video Games, What UX is Really About, Game UX Summit founder and chair. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. I'm very happy to be here today uh, to talk to you about implicit biases and inclusion through the lens of cognitive science because this is uh, my background. And uh, let's jump right into it. I know that it takes a little while for the clicker to follow me. I've been told, just press it once and wait for it. But maybe I did not press enough. See, that's the problem in UX. It's like lack of feedback. You don't know if you have to press it. OK, all right, let's do that again. Uh, I could tell you about all the data and the research that uh, is showing that inclusion is very important for businesses. But instead, I'm going to show you this video that I found on Twitter a few years ago because it's very self-explanatory. OK, Noel. You try it out. Come to your hand. Too black. Too black. Yeah. Come again. Come again, Sasha. Come again. 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 Right, go ahead. What's the color of your hand? <laughs> man, a black man ain't fighting. Fight. This is why you need an inclusive team. Uh, because if you don't, you know, probably what happened is, is we're mostly white people working on this soap dispenser and they tried it on themselves. Like, yep, yeah, it seems to be working. Let's ship it. And then all of a sudden you realize that it's not. Uh, accessible or usable for a large part of the population, and now that's too late. Um, and this is, I mean, it's a lighthearted example, it's just a soap dispenser, but uh, it's very well documented that this is happening for health devices or for systems like who gets to get a loan for their apartment. Um, so that's the reason why it's really important to have inclusion on your teams, uh, because then you can more, you're more likely to spot these problems way uh, ahead of time. Uh, and, and design is never going to be neutral. You're always going to make decisions on how you're going to design the space. If you have the handle on the door, that's going to influence you to grab the handle and pull. So any design is going to influence users on how to use it and can potentially exclude some of them. So it's really important to always try to find out how your design is going to exclude some people so we can track down uh, these elements and, and put the barriers down. Uh, so that's really important for that. Being inclusive on your teams is going to be a very uh, important asset. The problem that if you look at the developer satisfa satisfaction survey from uh, IGDA in 2021, this is what we find out about the demographics of the game industry. 78% uh, of game developers are white, 62% uh, identify as men, and 63% have no disabilities. So as uh, Tanya De Paz puts it, the industry is overwhelmingly white and male. And so that's a problem. This is something that we have to face and we have to fix so that we can have more inclusive um, games. But why is it so hard to be inclusive uh, just by ourselves? Uh, well, that's because the brain is limited. It has great capabilities, but also great limitations. So this is the work that I do. I teach people again and again about the brain limitations. Uh, this is a very simplified representation of what's going on in the brain as we uh, process information, like right now as we process uh, this talk. Uh, I'm not going to get into it today. That's not the point of this presentation. Um, but just remember that our mental processes, like perception, attention, memory, that are really critical uh, to uh, in process information, are very limited. Perception is subjective. We do not perceive the world as it is. It's a construction of the mind, so it's very subjective. Our attention resources are scarce. We can't really multitask. And memory is fallible. We're not really uh, remembering things very well. Uh, so knowing this, uh, this is how we can try to design things uh, better. And uh, also, because of these limitations of the brain, we have a lot of biases. And this is what we're going to talk about today. And to talk about this, I'd like to play a game. This is Games for Change, right? So do you want to play a game with me, hopefully? All right. After lunch, let's do it. 
Uh, so I'm going to ask you three questions I would like you to answer as fast as possible. I don't have a lot of time for this. Uh, if you already know these questions, please do not answer because that's cheating. Uh, but otherwise, just yell out uh, what you think is the correct answer as fast as possible. You ready? All right, first question. A bat and a ball cost $11 total. Knowing that the bat costs $10 more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? No, it is not $1, it's 50 cents. A few of you did not fall into the trap. Good job for those of these people. Second one, in a lake, there's a patch of lily pads. Every day, the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half of the lake? It's not 24. Like some people say, wait a minute, <laughs> there's, a, there's a trap here. Yes, it is 47 days. Good job. Now you know there are traps, so you're paying more attention. All right, last one. If it takes five machines, five minutes to take to make five widgets, how long would it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? And now no one wants to answer anymore. It takes five minutes. Yeah, it's a good job, five minutes. Yay, see, we can get better at this when we know that there's a trap. And that's a problem. We don't always know that there's a trap. Uh, this was the part of the cognitive reflection, reflection test conducted by Frederick in 2005. And in this study, um, it's revealing that 33%, a third of the people, the participants who went through these questions, miss, missed all three questions. 83% missed at least one of the questions. So if you're particularly good at math, uh, math maybe you did not fall for these ones. Uh, but we are falling for uh, biases all the time. And that's just because we're humans. And there's no way we can get out of it. And that's the problem. Uh, because of the limitations that we saw earlier, perception subjective, attention resources are scarce, memory fallible, we have all of these cognitive biases, and it's scary because it's overwhelming. We have all of these ones. Uh, this is a very nice visual representation of it. It's called the Cognitive Bias Codex. You can find it on Wikipedia. Uh, and you can see, like, it's coming from uh, we don't remember information well, so we're going to make bad decisions because of that, or we can't pay attention to everything. So I don't want to depress everyone uh, today, so we're not going to look at all these biases. Uh, instead, I would like to uh, highlight one bias, and this one, a social bias. Because yes, we also have social biases, not just cognitive biases. Uh, it's the in-group bias. This one is very prevalent and is creating a lot of problems. Um, it's a tendency to give preferential treatment to others we perceive as belonging to our own group. For example, I'm white. I'm a woman, I, I play games, um, I love Pearl Jam, for example, so I have a lot of these things, I'm French. Uh, so if I meet you uh, today and we chat and I perceive you, it's all about perception. Again, subjective, it's not based on your DNA, it's not biologically based, it's just our perception. If I perceive that you're part of one of these groups, I'm gonna have a tendency to have you know, a preferential treatment with you. We all do that, we all bias in that way. Uh, and it's so entrenched in us uh, that we have increasing neuroscientific evidence that people process information from perceived uh, in-group and out-group members differently. So this is uh, an fMRI study. So we put people in an MRI and we ask them to uh, look at quotes and we tell them for the same quotes, we either tell them that this is coming from a leader uh, that they perceive is coming from their in-group or a leader from their outgroup. Again, it's all about perception. Same quote. And depending on you perceive that that quote is coming from um, your in-group or not, this, the areas of the brain is lined up are not the same. Uh, so even if you don't believe you do that, uh, you do it. <laughs> we all do it. And we can even measure it in the brain. So uh, it's complicated. And uh, this is how we end up with situations uh, where we're going to favor certain people even if we believe we have a strong process and we're making objective decisions, we're not objective people. That's why we need science uh, to find the truth in the world. Um, and this is what's going to happen. We're going to see a diversity of people when we hire. Uh, but then there's that person that maybe went to the same school as you did. Uh, and you're going to feel a connection with them and going to feel and they say afterwards, oh, yeah, I have a good, good feeling with that person. It really, I think um, that person is up for the task. And we're all going to do that. Uh, it's not that white men are inherently uh, bad at this. We are all bad at this, but it happens to be like in uh, the Western world today, uh, white men are predominantly at uh, very uh, influential positions, are the ones who can hire other people. 
and therefore because of the in-group bias, all of a sudden you realize that you have um, like a lot of homogeneity uh, in certain high-level positions, and this is why. Uh, and so it's really hard to tackle, especially because when we point that out, we also have another little problem here. We have kind of distance. And this is making the things even more complicated. Um, kind of distance is when you have conflicting attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors that are producing a feeling of mental discomfort. Say that you do not believe that you're racist or sexist. You're trying to do the best you can to be inclusive. But then someone points out, well, look around you. Like on your team, uh, there's mostly uh, the same people as you are, like maybe like a white man. Uh, and then we can be very defensive. Right? So, and this is how we restore balance when we have kind of dissonance. Because we don't want to be that person. But then someone points out, well, so, OK, how do you reconcile this? Uh, we're going to have a. a find a way to reconcile this, and the brain uh, is trying to restore balance, so we're gonna reject it. We're gonna say, well, no, like, I actually have a very strong process. Uh, we hired the best people, just, they just happened to be men. Uh, just, we didn't find any women anywhere, they couldn't find them. Uh, and, and you know, sometimes, sometimes it's true, sometimes it's hard, uh, but we still <laughs> have this kind of dissonance that is, not, is gonna make us post-rationalize our decisions. And so that's why uh, implicit bias training um, doesn't work um, many often, and even sometimes backlashes, uh, because we, we don't want to be confronted uh, with this, and so we just reject the whole thing. So it's a very touchy uh, situation, it's complicated, but you have to uh, approach kind of and social biases really like optical illusions. Um, so in this image, you perceive A as being uh, much darker than B, uh, on this board here uh, because of the perception that the brain has um, of the shadow. But if I remove the background, you can see as a fact that A is exactly of the same shade of, like, of B. Um, but if I put the background again, and I promise you I'm not cheating, um, now you can still perceive A as darker than B. Again, construction, uh, perception is a construction of the brain. And even if you know about it, you can't unsee that. That's the problem with uh, kind of biases and social biases. Even if you know about them, you're still gonna fall for them. And so knowing about it is a first step, it's important. Uh, but sadly, education only about these biases are not gonna be sufficient. Uh, because it's so implicit that we don't realize when it's going to happen. Uh, if you wanna know more about uh, our biases and how it's shaping the world, because the people who shape the world who make the, um, the products and the systems, you know, depending on where they're coming from, are gonna shape the world in a certain way that possibly is gonna exclude some people uh, and give a preferential treatment to others. So uh, these are some recommendations uh, to uh, dive uh, further down. So what can we do? Could AI help us? If humans are bad at this, maybe the machines can help us out. Uh, I'm sure you know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of data showing that, sadly, um, AI is, is just as biased as humans, and even uh, worse, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, because it's biased in a way that we don't necessarily understand. It's that black box. We don't really uh, know what's going on there. And AI is trained with data that is already biased. You know, the internet is not a diverse and inclusive place to begin with. Um, and so the data is trained with already biased um, uh, elements. And if we just look at one of the recent elements, say chat GPT, um, you find out that it's relying on gender stereotypes to choose pronouns in many cases. Like for example, a kindergarten teacher is gonna be a she, uh, and a construction worker is gonna be a he. Another example, um, so sometimes I don't know if I should press again or not, <laughs> it's stressful. Um, another example, if you, uh, want ChatGPT to uh, tell a story about a boy and a girl choosing their careers, uh, the boy becomes a successful doctor when the girl becomes a beloved teacher. So it's still biased. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's even uh, biased in the worst way, in a way that we don't necessarily understand. So it's perpetrating discrimination and sometimes even amplifying those dis discrimination. Um, if you haven't heard of Timnit Gibru, I highly recommend you to look into her work. She's been raising the alarm with a lot of other uh, wonderful uh, women uh, about the biases and the dangers of AI. How many of you have been using ChatGPT or other LLM 
recently? No, a lot, a lot of people. How many of you learn, know about Timothy Gibbero's work? Yeah, less people. Okay, so <laughs> if you're using AI, please learn about the dangers of AI uh, because it's only by understanding those biases that we can really work with AI uh, in a constructive way. <clears throat> Another great uh, book I recommend is from the one from Cathy O'Neill, Weapons of Math Destruction. Some people know about it. And you learn in this book that a model's blind spots reflect the judgments and priorities of its creators. Um, so it's not a diverse group of people that is working on AI, sadly. Uh, and again, it's not that a certain group of people are, are bad people. It's just like any other human, they are biased. And so we need diversity everywhere. Uh, if we want to have uh, an inclusive uh, world. So to go further, take a look at uh, these people, books, and organization. Um, it's really, really fascinating. Okay, so if we cannot train ourselves uh, not to be uh, biased, and we f if we cannot have AI help us out, what can we do? Um, well, we need to purposely redesign the environment uh, so that we can make it more inclusive. Uh, we need to understand our biases, our limitations, still very important to educate for that, so that when we understand it, then we can redesign the environment to not fall for it. Now, for example, if you understand that um, memory is fallible, you're not gonna go shopping uh, without doing, uh, having a list. If you just rely on the memory for your, uh, uh, when you go to the grocery store, it's very likely that you're gonna forget about something. So instead of doing that and relying on your own capacities, know your own limitations, like the limitations that we all have, write down a list, and then you're more likely to not forget about something. So that's what we need to do for everything, uh, for our hiring processes, for our services, for our games. We need to understand those limitations and those biases so we can redesign all this stuff uh, to account for uh, our human factors and make society and games more inclusive. Uh, and this is where I'm going to start to talk about nudges. I'm um, sure a lot of you have heard of it. Uh, for those who don't know what a nudge is, it's a way that we design the environment to uh, favor a specific behavior uh, that is supposedly uh, the best for everyone. So here's a funny example uh, from the Amsterdam airport. Instead of telling people, please you know, respect uh, this environment, keep it clean, uh, so education is important, but it's not enough. And still, some people do not care. Um, the janitor instead put a, a sticker of, of a fly next to the drain. Um, and turns out that you guys are playful uh, because you aim at it. <laughs> and, and in some cases, it reduced the urinal spillage by 80%. Yay, games! <laughs> Um, so nudges are really important and we need to understand how they work. Um, the, the problem with nudges is they uh, need very strong ethical scrutiny because who decides what's better for you know, the environment, the world, uh, and design those nudges. So we also need to have diversity and inclusion in when we decide you know, what nudges we want uh, out in the world. Another example of how we can redesign the environment to make it more inclusive. Uh, it's an anecdote here, uh, and there's a lot of limitations about what I'm going to talk about, but it's just to show you how the environment can change um, our decisions and what we do. Back uh, in the 70s, there were uh, a lot of questions around orchestras in the US. Like There were a lot of white men in the orchestra. So what's going on with there? Maybe uh, the woman brain is not good at music. Uh, no, it turns out that the jury was mostly composed of white men. Again, it's not, you know, it's not inherently a bad group. It's just that we're all biased in a certain way. Um, and because they are making the decisions, the in-group bias kicks in. If you are seeing the, uh, the candidates, then you're gonna more likely uh, favor the people that look like you. So they started to do those blind auditions. Uh, and so there's a curtain and you don't see the person, you just hear them. And after they did that, uh, there was an increase of women uh, being hired in orchestras, uh, in some cases by 55%. Um, this is not solving for everything. This is only solving for the in-group bias. Uh, because if, to begin with, uh, a certain um, marginalized population do not have the same opportunity of access to, say, music education, then of course you have a smaller pool of people uh, who are going to be candidates. So it's not solving for everything, um, far from it, but it's just to show you that it's just a little cog 
uh, in the big machine, and we need to identify all these cogs so that we can change the environment to make it a more inclusive space. And to do that, we're going to iterate. Uh, initially, they didn't have a carpet, uh, so they could hear sometimes if you hear high heels, you're going to make an assumption that the person is probably a woman. Uh, and so they had to iterate on that. It's going to take a some time, and that's why having a design thinking uh, process where you uh, try to look at what's going on, try to prototype, you test, and then you iterate is going to be very important. That's what UX is about. I know a lot of you hear about UX, and a lot of you also think that UX is just about the UI. No, it's actually a mindset that is very important. It's a way to uh, uh, think about the whole process and how we can make games uh, in anything, any product, now better, faster, and uh, offering a better, a better experience for everyone. It's human-centered, so we understand the limitations of humans, and we design with these limitations in mind. It's grounded in science. It's not grounded in opinions. We have opinions, but we treat them as hypotheses that we're going to test. It's a collaborative process. You are all responsible. All of you, you're participating into pro uh, making something. Uh, and so all of you are, are responsible for the experience that your users and your players are going to have. And more importantly, it's a benevolent uh, approach. We care uh, about ethics. We uh, are here to improve people's lives with technology. So we care about ethics, accessibility, and inclusion. Um, so inclusive games and societies won't happen solely with good intentions. It's, it's important to start with intentions, and I'm sure all of you here are well-intended, and that's great, but that's not enough. Uh, and I love playing games for change. Uh, it's wonderful. It's, it's so much creativity there, creativity there um, and so much promise, but I still see a lot of those games that are not usable, let alone accessible and inclusive. So it's really going to be important to understand this process is better um, so that we can intentionally design to be inclusive. Um, and this is why we need some guidelines, and that's why I started with a few people, the Ethical Games um, Initiative, and uh, we're trying to define guidelines for the game industry so that games uh, can be more ethical for everyone and for workers. Uh, by the way, if you're a researcher and you're researching the impact of games on, on people or on workers, uh, we are currently doing a call for papers and a call for speakers. Um, and the conference is going to happen in January, so check out the ethicalgamesconference.org uh, to submit your paper or, and talk about it around you, please. Um, so this is where you can start. I recommend you to take a look at the Inclusive Game Design and Development paper from IGDA uh, from 2022. Uh, there's a lot of tips there that you can use to try to think, rethink how to make uh, games more inclusive. And take a look at the UX mindset. I promise you it's going to not only help you save time and money and make your games uh, having a better experience for everyone, uh, but it's also going to make you think about inclusion, accessibility, uh, and all these good stuff. Well, thank you uh, so much for your attention. If we want to change the world, uh, it's not as efficient to change people as it is to change the architecture of the world. So we need to think about how the box is designed currently so we can redesign it and fix it to make it inclusive for everyone. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay.